Hey guys, welcome back to The Constant Show, where I ruin movies that have already ruined themselves. This week's sacrifice, 2017's Jigsaw. So I'm going to do a play-by-play -play of everything that happens, uh, some jokes, and then also my general thoughts towards the movie. So the movie starts with the police rolling out this spike strip. This car drives over it. This car is being driven by who we will call Barista Guitarist, based on his wardrobe choices. He crashes into an empty police barricade. He's running through a building. It's like Casino Royale, but without any of the parkour. He gets to the roof. There's a couple cops that hold him at gunpoint. He finds an RC controller that's under a red X painted on a metal girder. He calls for Filthy Larry, who is the protagonist of our movie. And Filthy Larry shows up with Inspector Gullible. Inspector Gullible offers to take out Barista Katarist. He's like, I can shoot him in the chest. I got the shot. Filthy Larry tells them to aim for the RC controller, which they do, and they blow it to pieces. But then Barista Katarist gets shot in the chest by somebody. It cuts back to the rooftop to tell us that the game has started. We get the final part of a countdown for our players, like the digital clocks that Saul loves so much. They're waking up with chains around their necks and metal buckets over their heads. The chains hook into a wall of saws on the opposite side, and it's kind of slowly like dragging them. There's the main chick, the censored drug addict, sleepy guy, he's just kind of laying there, flannel shirt, and then used coke salesman. We will also get into that. Saw comes over the speaker, and he basically tells them that they're all liars, and they need to confess. There's a riddle, but it's so straightforward that it hardly qualifies. He's just like, shed any amount of blood, and you can go free. They still try to do the thing where characters like reflect on what he's saying. What could he mean in offering of blood, no matter how little? It drags four of them across the floor as Sleepy Guy just kind of keeps pace. Where they're all like pulling against it. But he's just passed out and about the same progress. The main chick realizes that like the puzzle is that you just have to cut yourself. So then she does that. Her helmet lights up green and then she takes it off. She starts helping the others to take theirs off as well. Except for Sleepy Guy, she doesn't really get to him in time. The chains pull them through this open wall as Sleepy Guy kind of wakes up. Cut back to the hospital where we find out that Barista Guitarist and Filthy Larry actually go way back. Filthy Larry describes him as his friend, but also says that he's into like drug dealing, armed robbery, and aggravated assault. Barista Guitarist is in a chemically induced coma after he got shot in the chest. Cut back to the barn. Our game players have a moment to consider their circumstances. We don't really learn anything besides their names, which you can already tell I'm not going to use. Cut to a random jogger chaining up her bike and coming upon a group of people staring. It was a weird slice of life moment. A bucketed man like hangs from the bridge overhead. The implication being that it was Sleepy Guy. Sergeant Embalmer, we'll get into that later. He plays catch with his daughter in the park as a car rides up on them. It's Filthy Larry. And Sergeant Embalmer's phone was off for a reason. But we never actually hear the reason because it just immediately cuts to him doing an autopsy on Buckethead with his assistant fangirl. They lazy the bucket off and it turns out the top half of the head is missing. It's like a jigsaw piece carved out and there's a USB inside that says, and then there were four. They immediately plug it into a computer. You can't do that because of viruses. It's a thing. It plays a voice clip of Jigsaw. Uh, the message is to an apprentice and it basically just says the games have begun, which we already know at this point, uh, as has been firmly established by both the first time it told us the games have begun and then that guy dying. We cut back to the barn. Uh, Billy the puppet wheels out on his bike with a message that reads confess. Chains start to pull them towards these rims. It's a bit of a step down because they were just getting pulled towards saw blades and now they're just getting pulled towards like a dull piece of metal. So main chick tries to wrap herself around a pole. The pole is like barbed wired. Then they go into sort of their first confessions. A flannel shirt just says that he sold a kid a bike. And then there was an accident that happened afterwards. Main chick says that she lost her kid because of her husband. Used coke salesman's like, that's not a confession, which thank you. So there's this tape like off to the side and then flannel shirt grabs it. And then uh, the rims fall down and then like the chains kind of swing out. It's almost like the first part of the trial was to find the tape recorder because the trap immediately falls apart when that happens. Like they're already attached to the chains. So he didn't really need to add that extra step. The main chick looks up and she's like, we're gonna hang. Three syringes drop down from the ceiling and they're in this little like holder thing. The tape says that pointing a finger at somebody else results in three pointing back at you. Hashtag deep. 
I remember when I learned about that in kindergarten. The voice recording also says that one of them is a purse snatcher. They've been poisoned. And in the three syringes is the antidote, saline, and then acid. The tape ends by asking how much is a life worth to you. On the side of each of the syringes is a number. But the numbers for the first two are like 10,000, 60,000, and then the last one's like 353. That's clearly the right answer. Who's carrying $10,000 in their person? And it would have been more impactful if all the numbers were close, but like the change was like different. So then you're like, oh, damn, was it 355 or 357? Used Coke salesman grabs all three of the syringes. There's a back and forth where he tries to make her take one. She's like, I'm not taking it. It's clear at this point which one the correct one is. He shows her the numbers and she actually realizes the riddle, but she still doesn't do anything different. Uh, used Coke salesman is starting to get impatient because she's not taking it. And he tells her to pick one as the chains go up, but then she doesn't. Used Coke salesman fights back and forth with her. And then eventually he like stabs her with all three syringes. They fall down. She rips the syringes out of her neck and it's like gushing blood and her eyes have like turned red. But it doesn't look like acid. There's no like smoke. There's no bubbling. Main chick and used Coke salesman fight about like what just happened. She's like, it was 353. She knew that. But you didn't say that. You were just kind of like, ah, oh, we're going up. We cut to the morgue. Buckethead was a gambler whose wife was killed in front of him. Filthy Larry actually investigated the case. And Sergeant Embalmer's like, but you didn't catch him, did you? They determined that Buckethead was killed by a rusty saw, but that he put up a fight. I think if you got your head cut off in the middle of a fight, you, you did not put up a fight. Cut to the barn. There is an open room with an arrow painted on the wall and three doors. This is where used Coke salesman says that he sold uh, bad mortgages and good Coke, and he cheated on his wife and his taxes. Used Coke salesman tries to, like, shovel open the only door that says no exit hold that thought he gets his foot caught in this wire trap as the floor gives away and then it's got these complicated like spools that like wrap around so that you have like wire just kind of i feel like if you didn't want them to go through that door and he doesn't like later on in the movie he's still very salty about this maybe just reinforce the door like all the other doors that we see this is the only door that it seems like you could possibly get through and instead of fixing that problem he's like i'm just gonna build an entirely another trap beneath the floors underneath the floor there's a handle a flannel shirt who takes off his flannel shirt at this point but it's still somehow the most memorable thing about him he takes the shovel and he starts tearing up the floorboards around the wire trap. He eventually manages to find a tape beneath the floor. But it's like, if you knew people might end up in that trap, like why would you put that in that location where they can't even see it or access it? I don't even know why Flannel Shirt was doing that in the first place. And then they grab the tape and all the tape says is pull the handle and release yourself. They didn't even need a tape. It's pretty clear that like that's your only option. Even worse, whenever they go to get the tape, the tape is like embedded into the wire trap. So he sticks a rake in there to try and reach it, but then the wires like snap the, the rake in half and you're expected to like reach your hand down in there. It's almost like he was ashamed of that tape and he was like, I'll just put it beneath the floorboard and the wire trap and then they'll never have to hear it. But back to the morgue. They found feces in the body of decapitated guy. It contains a pig virus. Now I know there's a deleted scene of him just rubbing like diseased pig poop on like the decapitated guy. Like that happened. Did he test the pig first to make sure that it had the pig virus so that he could do that? What is the point of that? And she's like, we're gonna triangulate wherever this poop came from. And then the scene is immediately interrupted by another one. The body was found at Barista Guitarist Hospital. And then Sergeant Embalmer's like, do you think it's a little weird that he's a dead body here? Sergeant Embalmer says that he recognizes like the hydrofluoric acid wound from his time and wherever. And excuse me? And he says that he like never saw it injected, that it's like, what are you even talking about? I saw it eat through a floor one time. It kind of looked like that. Uh, they discuss fangirl, uh, start asking about her alibi. We cut back to the barn. 
a door in the silo opens and then a light flicks on main chick and flannel shirt and enter into the silo there's a string or a remote and then there's a TV that drops down inside the silo, but then also under the floor. Which again, is a crazy amount of foresight to put into something that you didn't think was going to happen. Like, you, you put the do not enter, but then you also put like flat screen TVs in both of these locations. Main chick has to stand on flannel shirts, shoulders in order to reach the remote. Once she does, the silo door closes. Both TVs come on. Used coke salesman now has to pull the lever in order to save them. Grains of something just start pouring into the silo, and then they're both like, ah, pull the lever, pull the lever. But he doesn't want to pull the lever. Then we cut back to the morgue. Filthy Larry asks Fangirl about her alibi. Filthy Larry and Inspector Gullible talk to Sergeant Embalmer about Fangirl's dark web subscription to Jigsaw's fan site, which is apparently a thing. They traced her through the dark web. Cut back to the silo still filling up with grains. Used Coke salesman still can't pull the lever, and then sharp objects begin to fall. Used Coke salesman out of nowhere has one of those bursts of endorphins where characters are just like, that's it, I can do it. He pulls the lever, the doors to the silo open, the main chick and flannel shirt spill out. Main chick almost lands face first into a rake. I'm watching a Saw movie, the deaths shouldn't be accidental. Then we cut back to Sergeant Embalmer and Fangirl having drinks and discussing how they're under suspicion. Sergeant Embalmer starts telling her a story about how Filthy Larry roughed up this guy and because of it, that guy got off. She tells him that her alibi from earlier was a lie because she was actually at her studio. Her studio is a gallery of jigsaw traps, which I'm not sure how anybody would know about. He starts admiring her recreations of some of these traps, and then he sees a new one, which is just this giant like metal vortex thing, and then he starts asking her about it, and she's like, yeah, that's, that's an old one that he never released, and I found the blueprint of it online. Who put that online? Inspector Gullible takes photos of the two from outside. The guitarist gets poisoned in the hospital. It's almost like he could have just died from the gunshot and it uh, wouldn't have actually made a difference. The main chick patches up used coke salesman's missing leg. We cut to Sergeant Embalmer and he gets out of bed and there are these scars on his back. If they're supposed to be from the first trap, the uh, saw blades were actually like horizontal. But the scars on his back are like lopsided. There's no way that that actually could have happened unless he was just... I'm not sure how he got those scars. Guy comes in and he tells Inspector Gullible that the commissioner wants to see John Kramer's dead body in order to verify that he's actually dead. Cut to the barn. There's a tractor that has a red X on the hood uh, and a tape inside of it. Flannel shirt actually knew the bike was defective whenever he sold it to the kid. And the kid that he sold it to was John Kramer's nephew. He presses play at the perfect spot to get hung upside down. He's kind of like walking around the barn. And then uh, out of nowhere, it's one of those like rope traps where you, which is lucky because he could have been in anywhere. He gets lifted above what I call the whirly bird trap. So it's a spinning metal cylinder that is spun by like a motorcycle that's on top of it. And then the bottom at the center of the whirly bird is a motorcycle handle that you can use to stop it. For the main chick, she climbs up this wooden pillar and then jumps across from one to the other to try and get to the top. And then when she does, she takes this metal stick and then jams it into the bike's back rim in order to stop it. Flannel shirt celebrates way too soon. Even as you can hear like the metal kind of like cranking, he's just like, yeah, get me out of here. Makes no effort to grab the handle. What do you know? The whirly bird starts back up and he gets spaghetti. Cut to John Kramer's open grave and inside of his grave is barista guitarist. Shocker, I know, but also incredibly stupid. Police bust into Fangirl's studio. Filthy Larry finds a fake wall on the inside of it and there's clippings of jigsaw all over the back part of it. He goes to hit the light switch and then a flayed body like drops down and sort of like swings out. Filthy Larry and Inspector Gullible split up so that they can make arrests. Filthy Larry is going to go after Fangirl 
and Inspector Gullible is going to go after Sergeant Embalmer. Inspector Gullible shows up at Sergeant Embalmer's place and then basically tells him everything. We also learn during this scene that Inspector Gullible is internal affairs. The whole reason that he was sent to the department was so that he could keep an eye on Filthy Larry. Because throughout the movie, we learn that Filthy Larry is literally every kind of bad cop. He's the cop who cares too much and is over aggressive and then beats people up and then they get off. He's the cop who takes bribes. Any bad cop stereotype you have, Filthy Larry does that, and he's proud of it. Sergeant Embalmer starts talking about how he's being framed. So Sergeant Embalmer is like, who found the body at the studio? And then Inspector Gullible's like, I think that was Filthy Larry. Keep in mind, at this point, he's already literally seen Sergeant Embalmer at this studio. Sergeant Embalmer's like, who ordered them to target the trigger? Filthy Larry. And he's like, but did anyone see Filthy Larry targeting the trigger? Because he didn't want Barista Guitarist to make it off of that roof. What? If Filthy Larry didn't want him to make it off of that roof, wouldn't he just tell Inspector Gullible to kill him when Inspector Gullible asks, hey, should I kill him? So Sergeant Embalmer is like, I don't know what he has against me. And then Inspector Gullible's just like, yeah, actually, I kind of do, because two years ago, you went off on him in a very public setting about how you felt like he was a bad cop who lets people go. And then he just ignores this. Sergeant Embalmer is like, here, why don't you take me to do an autopsy? I'll prove that it was him. Inspector Gullible takes him all the way back to the station and then lets him examine a patient that he might have killed. Sergeant Embalmer's like, what kind of rounds do you use? And he's like, I use, I don't know, 45. And then he's like, yeah, most people at the department do, except for Filthy Larry. What do you know, this bullet right here came from one of Filthy Larry's. Inspector Gullible is completely sold. Fangirl shows up at Sergeant Embalmer's house. And he tries to talk her out of going to the farm. She's like, I have a gun. Let's save lives. Cut to the barn. The main character is trying to escape through a narrowly chained door. And then she gets knocked down and a pig shows up with the mask and she gets syringed. The main character and used coke salesman wake up on either side of a table and then Kramer shows up. The real Kramer. He's like kind of putting stuff away. He's got like his pig mask on the table and he's got some like circular saws that we didn't really get to see him bust out this movie, but he's cleaning up around the place. Used Coke Salesman is a repeated drunk driver. That's his son, I guess. Kramer's brain scans at the hospital were mixed up and apparently they would have been able to treat his cancer better if they had known about it sooner. The main character is actually Kramer's old neighbor. And we get this flashback sequence, which is honestly one of the most gripping parts in the entire movie. Um, it's very subtle. It doesn't directly show it, but it's heavily implied that the main character actually is the one who killed her baby. After she killed her baby, she framed her husband for it, and then he ended up hanging himself in an insane asylum. Cut to Sergeant Embalmer and Fangirl arriving at Jill Tuck's farm which we now learn is where the game is happening. Inspector Gullible is searching Filthy Larry's house. They go into his refrigerator, and then they find the puzzle pieces that have been cut out of people. Sergeant Embalmer and Fangirl search the empty farmhouse. Uh, they find the starting room and examine it. All the lights are off. We cut back to Kramer, and he's talking about how pigs are nice because we needed more pig theming throughout this movie. And he tells them that they've been doing things backwards. He places a shotgun between them on the table and he puts a shell inside and he's like, this is the key to your freedom. Rules are simple. You have one shotgun and you have one shell. Jigsaw kind of limps off. It looks like he's had a really long day setting this one up. Cuts to the farm again. Sergeant Embalmer tries to blame Fangirl for the killings. Filthy Larry ambushes Sergeant Embalmer and he holds him at gunpoint and there's a Mexican standoff between Filthy Larry and Fangirl. Filthy Larry and Sergeant Embalmer fight for the gun. Fangirl runs away. Cut back to the shotgun and the final survivors. The main chick starts going crazy. She's like, ah, I know what he means. You've got to play the game. You've got to kill the other people. 
So then she takes aim, and as she does, used coke salesman realizes that the riddle that Kramer was trying to tell him, the shotgun backfires, killing the main chick because she had it backwards. Used car salesman, realizing what's happened, he looks at the expended shotgun shell, and it turns out that both keys were actually inside there. And we know that because the locks are color-coded. And we get a flashback of John Kramer actually putting the keys into the shotgun shell. In case that was the part of this movie that you found unbelievable. Then we reach our final showdown. So it's Sergeant Embalmer and Filthy Larry. Each one of them is wearing a collar of the same laser pointers that was used to take off Buckethead's bucket. There is a panel with a button for each of them. And the rules of the game are simple. They just have to confess. And it sets like a 60 second time limit in case they want to. And then Sergeant Embalmer's like, let's not press the button. Let's not say anything. And then Filthy Larry's like, yeah. But then he's Filthy Larry, so he doesn't. He presses the button on Sergeant Embalmer's and then it pulls him back. He's already locked into the laser pointer. You didn't really need to move him in order to laser him. And he admits that he's the one who actually mixed up Kramer's um, charts. I mean, for whatever reason, it still goes off, blood gushes out of his neck, and he falls down. Filthy Larry starts confessing to his crimes. And like I said earlier, he's every kind of bad cop. So he's like, you know, I put innocent people behind bars and I let guilty people go. I don't know how my job works. He keeps confessing as the laser's like, like close in and they start to like burn the ceiling and then he looks over at the other ceiling and realizes that there's no laser marks there what happened it turns out that sergeant embalmer is actually one of jigsaw's apprentices his recruitment process was actually just he was the sleepy guy at the beginning of the movie and then jigsaw felt bad because the trap broke and he said he shouldn't have to die over an honest mistake which seems like a little late to make that realization, considering that you put him into a death trap and literally nothing has changed. Jigsaw says, we can never come from anger nor vengeance. You taught me that. But he actually didn't. Sergeant Embalmer actually recreated the voice clips that we hear throughout the movie in editing software. Sergeant Embalmer is the one who sniped Barista Guitarist on the roof. He switched the bullet casing earlier, put the blood under the fingers. We find out that the game we've been watching this entire time actually happened 10 years ago. Sergeant Embalmer went out and found people that Filthy Larry should have arrested, but didn't, and then put them through the exact same set of traps. Sergeant Embalmer activates the lasers, killing Filthy Larry for cheating. Game over. This movie is like the Vescola of the Saw series. This movie is like a self-insert fan fiction written by the kid from Saw 6. Marty McFly went back in time to take credit for the Zodiac killings and it was somehow still boring. This movie is like if somebody replaced the marshmallows in your Lucky Charms with raisins, and then the minute that you poured a bowl, they were like, gotcha! This movie is like trying to play a goodwill version of Mousetrap with half the pieces missing and the instructions written in kanji as your friend tries to explain to you that you're actually playing Operation, but you're not. It's like if you programmed a robot entirely from criticisms of people who only half watched the previous movies. This movie turns the Saw series into a fireworks show that ends with a sparkler. This movie is like a jigsaw puzzle that describes itself as challenging because all the pieces are filed off. So Jigsaw has problems both as a standalone film and as a part of the Saw series. When you watch through it with all the information, you realize that 90% of the plot is just hollow and unimportant. The entire A plot about the game that is currently happening actually happened 10 years ago and is almost wholly irrelevant to the stuff that's going on now. For the B plot, the main question that it asks is Jigstaw still alive? Is John Kramer still alive? He's not. He's clearly not. Sergeant and Balmer's actions make no sense whenever you consider them with the full context of the movie. So his plan is to recreate a game from 10 years ago that nobody knows about and then to put filthy larry's freed criminals into that game 
would do a bunch of elaborate ruses to try and convince everybody that John Kramer is still alive. All, all the characters have this express knowledge of like the games and stuff. Like even the fangirl has like a, a trap from like Saw 2. You should be aware of the fact that he doesn't actually need to prove that John Kramer is still alive. As a matter of fact, he could actually use Strom from uh, Saw 5, who was one of the people who got framed as being Jigsaw originally. The fact that he's doing all of these elaborate ruses, most of which are pretty high risk, in the middle of an ongoing investigation, as he does the game, as he's a successful father, as he does like autopsies and continues to go to his job, it just gets to the point where he could not have done that. Even for John Kramer, who was doing the games pretty much at his leisure and had two to three assistants, depending on like where you're at in the timeline, that's all he does. But this guy is leading a full life. He's out there setting traps. He's also digging up corpses. The game is poorly designed in an unintended kind of way. Example. Billy rides out with a sign that says confess, and then they start getting pulled towards the hubcaps until Flannel Shirt removes this tape from the side. You guys remember that part from the summary. Why was that set up like that? You could have just put the tape on Billy and then had it play when he came out. And the syringes have an obvious answer. Why even ask the question? The game could have ended if nobody decided to inject the one girl early on in the movie, and I don't know what he would have done, but I love the idea that he's pulling off all these complex, like, mechanisms. He's got wires beneath the floor and, like, backup plans, and then he's like, oh, God, where do I put the tape? Uh, the timeline doesn't actually fit anywhere. So there's actually one line in the movie that precludes it from ever fitting into the first seven films. The line is said at the very end in a flashback between John Kramer and Sergeant Embalmer. John Kramer says, we should never act out of anger or vengeance. You taught me that. If you actually go back and watch the first trap that Jigsaw designs chronologically, when Cecil is in his trap, he starts talking to John and uh, apologizing for what happened. And John says, I forgive you which means that even at the earliest point in the Saw timeline, Kramer was already of the mindset that it's about forgiveness rather than vengeance. So if this guy taught him that, that would imply that they actually met before that, which would mean that this game actually took place before John Kramer even designed the first trap Maybe you have some stuff in the A plot of the story about how things just aren't lining up. Like maybe on the tape, it's like Kevin. And then like the people in the trap are like, my name's Bill. What is that? Who is this for? 